So my name is Ivan Mladenovic, uh, and this is uh, Paths to Profitability. Because as, as I said in a, uh, I think the first panel, I'm, I'm in the repair business, I'm not in the repair business. So if you are a purist and you are here, you're not going to enjoy this. Um, so this was the intro, this is the title. So uh, some questions, let's start off with a little couple questions. How many of you own a retail repair business? You have a store, a physical location. Okay, uh, how many of you have a mobile repair business? No physical location? Okay, how many of you provide IT services to businesses, B2B? Okay, very cool. Um, how many recyclers or refurbishers do we have in the room? A lot, okay, cool, interesting. Um, and so I, I wanna do like a kind of a countdown. Uh, raise your hand if you would repair at least 100 devices per month. Put your hand down if you don't do at least 250. 500? A thousand? More than two thousand? That cool. All right, just interested in that. Um, so really quickly about me, really boring stuff. Uh, I was born in Belgrade, Serbia. Moved to Miami when I was three years old. Uh, I wanted to get a film degree. Uh, got a film degree. Moved to LA. Made movies for about two or three years. Um, realized that I really wanted to make money and not just make movies. So I came back. Um, Worked as a, a director of IT for a hedge fund for about nine months. A hedge fund was raided by the U.S. Marshals because it was actually a Ponzi scheme. Um, had to figure out what to do with my life and decided to start a business. So I decided to start a repair business because I was a little bit of a nerd. I knew enough about fixing devices and it was something that I could do in my kitchen and, and kind of start doing immediately. So uh, this was my first shop, AKA my kitchen. Um, and uh, I, I had the vision for this. So I had a vision for a retail shop where someone could walk in and complain about their, their technology. Um, and so three years after I started the business, we built our first tech bar location, uh, and this is what we ended up with. Um, so I, I, I have two businesses. Uh, la at the beginning of last year, I branched out the two businesses uh, into Primo and Tech Bar. It used to be all called Primo. Uh, I was lucky enough to get techbar.com, so that's why that name exists. Um, so Tech Bar is our B2C business. We do computer phone and tablet repair. We do um, in-home services, so setting up wireless networks, um, uh, printers, things like that. And then our, our IT consulting business is called Primo. We're primarily a managed services provider, so we do monthly unlimited support contracts for businesses with at least 20 employees. Um, very different businesses. That's why I split the, them separately. Uh, I'm, I was also seeking, you know, exploring the idea of franchising Tech Bar, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but that's why they, they're, they're separate entities. And I think it's an intelligent idea if you do, the, do, these, if you do, do these two services to split up those two businesses. So the real title of this presentation is Learn From My Mistakes. Um, I, I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I've learned a lot of lessons. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of different kinds of businesses. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm definitely a, a student of entrepreneurship more than a student of repair. So I'm really interested in how these businesses operate, how they make money. Um, because, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm really not a purist. I do enjoy repairing devices. I'm a big advocate for repairing devices because that's the business I am. But I'm in a business, and I'm sure that's why all of you are here in the room talking about profitability, because you're here to make money. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that affect me making money uh, and, and it can affect your business in, in, in generating revenue. Um, so the first thing, if you haven't started this business yet or you haven't done sort of your background homework, you have to know who are you targeting? I think that's relative to a lot of different things. It's relative to your geography. It's relative to the type of people you're serving. It's relative to your budget. So, you know, is that your market? Is your market a family? Um, is your market, you know, a, a series of business professionals? Who's in your area? You know, that's my market. <laughs> my market is 35 to 55 housewife. That's my market. I know that because of the, the area I'm in and, and the demographics of the people that walk into my store. Do I have other people that walk into my store? Of course I do. But my demographic has an unlimited budget, generally. So that's why I'm able to charge 220 bucks for an iPhone 6 repair. And people in other parts of, my, uh, uh, in other parts of Miami cannot do the same because of the market that they're in. Um, and, and my customers don't want to drive. 20 minutes to go get that same repair for $50 less. They'd just rather come into my store, and obviously for, for a host of other reasons, but, but that's, that's why they come. Um, I'm really a, a big believer in people. Um, growing up, my mom worked uh, for, for large employment agencies, so she taught me the value of, 
um, finding the right people and, and empowering them to do a really good job. So I'm a really big believer in, in hire, train, and retain, and, and it starts with hire. So obviously you have to find really good people. It's really hard to find experienced techs. Um, you can certainly poach from your competitors, but that's kind of not cool. So uh, th this is kind of a quote that I think that's really important. Um, it says, uh, this is Jim Collins. If you've read any of his books, Good to Great, Built to Last. If you haven't, pick them up immediately. They're awesome uh, entrepreneurship and, and business reading. Um, it's talking about getting the right people on the bus, getting the wrong people off the bus, and then the people that are on the bus in the right seats. So making sure that the person that is managing your store actually is a manager uh, and has managerial qualities. Um, the person that is repairing your devices is not just a guy that sits and repairs devices, but that he can also communicate to your client. Um, it's really important who, you're, who is representing your business represents your brand. Um, so these are two tools that I use for hiring. Um, ZipRecruiter is a really cool uh, tool that allows me to create um, job postings and uh, it, it pushes it across a variety of different um, networks. It also allows you to, to pay uh, to post it on LinkedIn and Monster.com, places like that. And it also tracks your entire hiring process um, so you know who you're getting. It's a monthly service, costs about 100 bucks a month, I think. And what's cool about it is I just keep the ad running in perpetuity. I never actually let it know that I hired somebody. So I basically always have resumes flowing in, and whenever I need to hire somebody, I start looking at the flow of resumes that are coming in. They, always, they come to you know, careers at primo.com or careers at techbar.com. Um, I think also you should sort of, depending on the, the size of business that you run, you should also perpetually be interviewing. You should always be meeting new people because one thing is you can get comfortable with the employees you have, but you may not realize that there's a superstar that really wants to work for you. Um, so finding that person is really important. A really easy way to assess these people is hire select. So it's a company called Criteria built a software platform that costs somewhere I think about thousand dollars a year. And what it does is it it's like a, it's kind of like a disc profile, it's a personality type test, but it's really focused on specific professions. So you can build your own um, test for what I want a technician to look like. So it will test. Uh, it does a, a, they do a basic uh, arithmetic and reading comprehension test, which is really nice because you know if your technician you know, has some education and can understand punctuation, can understand how to do math if he's you know, giving change to somebody or something like that. Um, it does a customer service test, so it assesses if that technician um, is going to do a good job in a customer service role. It does a, a managerial test. Um, it does a trustworthiness test. Does your tech have the propensity for theft, for example? Um, and then there's also like smaller modules, there's like a sales module, there's like other things that you can add into it. But it's a really cool tool because it's a one-time fee, you can push as many tests out as, as much as possible. Uh, we don't hire anybody until they've completed the exam. And the exam, my exam is about two hours long, so just the fact that it takes that long means that they have to want the job. Um, and so it's, it's a nice way to, to give a, an initial assessment on, on who that person is. And obviously you can have that content um, ready during your interview and you can discuss things that came up. You know, I noticed that you have, you, you know, you score really high on this particular thing, but really low on this particular thing. Let's talk about that and get to know the person a little bit better. Um, these are some really good interview questions that we ask. Um, if someone comes in to work for you and they don't know anything about your company, cross off the candidate. If they're not doing their homework about you, if they don't want to work for you, if they don't understand the way your business operates, they already are at a loss because there's people that will also come in and they will have seen your website, they will have looked you up. Um, so my, my most interesting hiring story is Jermaine. So Jermaine is 19 years old. Uh, he's a young black guy and he lives in a really tough part of town uh, in Miami. Um, and he's, he's been through a lot. And he emailed me personally. I don't publish my email address. I always have like everything driven to careers at techbar.com. He emailed me personally and the gist of his message was, I want a job, any job. Because I like to repair devices and I want a job. So I said to my manager, I said, interview him. Uh, my manager interviewed him. He forwarded me the resume, said, you should talk to this kid. He came in and he did a three-month internship over the summer. And he got hired. And he's become one of our most productive techs. So you also have to be sent I'm, I'm sure you guys get lots of influx of people that want to work for you, or, or hopefully you do. Um, but you should really give some time to the people that really strike you. So if someone emails you a really good cover letter, um, ask for a cover letter, by the way. That's, a, that's a, usually a good tip, too. Ask them to write something that's not generically just sending you their resume. If they don't write the cover letter and you ask for a cover letter, they don't follow directions. And they're going to treat your business like that, too. Um, big into the apprenticeship concept. 
there's not a tremendous amount of tutorial-based education for this beyond iFixit and things like where you can have a technician say, you know, sit and watch this and learn how to repair. So we definitely do a, a buddy system internally. Usually it's the manager with a tech for a period of about three months after they're hired. Um, and, and we're following up mainly, uh, they're obviously getting repair knowledge, but that's about 40% of what they're doing. 60% is customer service driven. So we want them to have the experience of answering the phone. So like for the first, month that technician is number one person that's going to be answering the phones and we have them have the experience of talking to an, an unhappy customer we have them have the experience of talking to somebody that um, needs an update immediately or needs something right away we have the they have the conversation of quoting on the phone or, or, or trying to drag someone to come into the store to talk about their particular service so the buddy system helps a lot because it, it's very active teaching um, and it generally works very well for these types of professions um, so the second tip. Like yeah, so I do paid internships. Um, I don't believe in unpaid internships. It's actually sort of unethical. Um, it depends on how you structure it. So if you give school credit, you can give them a, a lower pay. But like at the end of the day, you know, I think it's important for them to understand the value of money. You know, watching Jermaine get his first paycheck was cathartic. That is that is a feeling that you will never. You cannot explain to anybody because he does, does, there's no con, you know, this is a minimum wage employee, but that, that this made 900 bucks for two weeks of work that he's, he's never seen 900 bucks before. And it's his. Um, it's, it's a really important thing to do. Um, oh, sorry. So the second thing I, I, I learned is, is to build very good vendor relationships. Um, before this, doing this, I worked for a global sourcing company and we did a lot of stuff in China and India and Pakistan. And building really good relationships with your vendors allows you to, to create very high leverage relationships. Um, it's obviously a little bit more challenging in building those relationships overseas. Um, but in my case, uh, I, I do a lot of my purchasing here actually. I do a lot of, of US-based purchasing. And, and in building a good relationship with those people, uh, like we do some business with eTech parts, right? So Jeremy, who I've never met before, I actually met yesterday for the first time from eTech parts, really cool guy. But I've talked to him about 30 times. 29 of the 30 times had nothing to do with the price of my parts. It had to do with us discussing the industry, talking, you know, un understanding better from his side of the, the coin and my side of the coin what's important to each of us. And as a result, I think it's affected my business relationship with them. It's affected how they treat me when we need an exception or we need something now. They treat us a little bit differently. So um, I think that applies with any type of relationship, but specifically with your vendors, um, being able to budget and plan and, and, and create a good supply chain for your business is critical. When you're at the smaller scale, I think people get caught up a little bit too much in what's the price of the repair and less with how many repairs are we getting. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, between you and your competitor, if you guys are $10 off or 20 bucks off, it's not going to make or break your business. But if you get 100 more repairs than your competitor and you're 20 bucks less, that's interesting. So I think that, that there's a lot of conversation about you know, different parts of the country, what's the cost of an iPhone 6 repair? I generally, I'm, I'm usually the most expensive guy just because I, you know, people will, will pay whatever if they feel the value of the service is. So if they feel my value of my service is worth 220 bucks, that's what they're gonna pay for it. And you can work, you, know, you can test it, test your market, adjust your prices on some sort of sliding scale and decide at what point the highest price you could possibly charge for a particular service that, that still makes sense for your customer. Um, so set the rules. I think this is really, really important um, to do on the onset. Um, I'm really big about etiquette and, and the perception that my employees give of our business. Um, I, I'm not a no fix, no fee business. We charge a diagnostic fee because our time is very valuable to us. And it also puts a little bit of skin in the game for the customer who understands now that we're gonna put effort into figuring out what's wrong with this device. Now that I've been here and I've learned how many businesses are doing no fix, no fee, I see the argument for that model. This just happens to be ours. Um, we charge $35 as a diagnostic fee. We think it's, it's been the number that's worked the best where there's not a lot of pushback. Sometimes there's push, pushback. Uh, one in a thousand repairs, there's pushback. And for that guy, I send him packing. I said, just don't come here ever again. Um, it's, if you don't understand the value of that from, from, from a customer standpoint, that our time is, you know, we hire good quality people. We pay our interns. We, 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 we have a cost of doing business. And, and the customer tends to appreciate that when, when we, do, uh, we do that for them. Um, we have a master services agreement. 
make sure you have, you have a lawyer write this for you, or take somebody else's and have your lawyer review it so that it, it aligns with your business. Um, this will release you from a lot of liability. Um, things like, you know, if you do a repair, does it void the warranty? I was just talking about that with somebody. Um, you know, those are things that your customer can sign in, in Repair Shopper, which is the software that we use. You can actually sign it digitally in Repair Shopper, so you can have a record of that for, for eternity. Uh, but it's a very important thing to have in place. And some of the things you should disclose, you should talk to your customer about, because they're not going to obviously read your master services agreement. But but I think that it's something that if there's something relative to a particular repair that, that is not covered within your master service agreement or whatever, you should say something because um, you, don't, you don't want that customer to have a bad experience just because they didn't read the fine print. That's, that's kind of like not, I don't think that's good business. Um, things that are in red in my presentation are very important. <laughs> Communication will absolutely make or break your business. It's not how well you did the repair. It's not who your parts supplier is. It's not what you're charging for iPhone 5 screens. Communication will make or break your business. If you explain to your techs the importance of talking to your customers on a regular basis, whether it be when they bring the device in, communicating with say, hey, talk to me about what's wrong, what's happening, how can I help? Um, whether it be if there's a, a snag in the repair, the part is delayed, um, the, the repair didn't go as expected, you know, we've actually damaged your device beyond repair. Talking to them about what happened is the most important thing. And letting them know, you know, number one, we're, if, it's, if it's, a, it's a mistake, we're so sorry. And, and here's what we're gonna do to fix it. And, and you will probably, you'll probably rarely end up with like a super elated, happy customer, but you will not end up with a furious, angry, ready to trash you on every social media platform customer. And that's a very dangerous customer. Um, your brand is everything. Um, this is very important if you intend to scale your business. This is very, very important uh, on the way that you appear to your customers. Um, the, the way your store looks, is it clean? Do you have cables all over the place? Um, is your wall full of products or do you only have three things on the wall? Um, each one of those things is so important to your business. Um, you know, what do your texts look like? Um, what are they dressed in? Do they, do, they, do they represent your brand? Are they, you know, cleanly shaven? Do they, do they, have, do they need a haircut? Like, these are things that are, are essential for the way that you represent your business. And it also is reflected in how you can make money. Because if, if, if you want to charge premium prices, you better look like premium. You have to look like a business that, that really reflects what you're about. Um, Obviously, social media affects our businesses dramatically. I'm sure a lot of you market on social media just because it's a very cost-effective marketing platform. These are sort of the, the big three, and Yext is kind of another thing I'll talk about in a sec. So Yelp is obviously very important. You know, Jess and I just had a conversation about Yelp and, or not Yelp. Um, Yelp's there. It's not going away. So learning to leverage it is really important. Um, most large cities, uh, and, and certainly every state, has a Yelp community manager. Uh, you can tweet that person and talk to that person about um, how Yelp is affecting your business doesn't cost you anything. Um, but if something's happening with your page or, or you're not getting a response or you can talk to this person, they might not give you the answers you like, but creating advocates out of Yelpers and, and certainly Yelp elite members um, is really powerful. It was really powerful in my business. Uh, when it comes to SEO, if you Google Computer Repair Miami, the first link is my Yelp page. It's not my website. It's not anybody else's website. It's not a Google local profile. It's not a map. It's nothing. It's my Yelp page with a ton of awesome reviews, and it generates a ton of walk-in business for me. Um, obviously, monitoring your, your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media, whatnot is important. Same thing. For the ability to respond when someone has a question about something, uh, make sure you claim your business, obviously, on, on, on Google Places. Um, and Yext is a really awesome tool. Basically allows you to publish your business listing and, and make it uniform across like 60 different platforms. And it costs like three or $400 a year. Um, so if you change addresses or you adjust your phone number, it just does it across all the platforms rather than you have to go to every single site. So it's a, just a nice way to, to manage it. Is it your own social media? Do you have somebody doing that? Or? Uh, I manage my own social media uh, to my detriment sometimes. <laughs> Um, but I, I, so, like, I just gave the responsibility of, of Yelp to my manager in one of my big stores, and um, he basically writes the response. We're required, uh, my standard is we, we respond to negative reviews within 60 minutes. I have 60 minutes to craft a response and know what's going on. So if a negative Yelp review comes in, he has 45 minutes to respond to me, and then we craft it together. That's part of our sort of mentorship concept, and eventually I'll let him do it himself. Um, but I think it's, it's really important that you have a pulse on that as a business owner. 
I guess it gets tricky once you have 10, 20, 30, 40 stores, but I don't know sort of what the, the number of, you know, I think if you have less than five stores or six or seven stores, you can keep a pulse on that and it doesn't, it's not very taxing to you. Um, but I think it's really important to know what's going on. Um, business acumen tends to be the average repair store owner's uh, worst um, suit. They tend to be more tinkers, nerds, like that, that's the personality of, of most of the computer repair business owners I've met. They don't understand how to read a, a, a profit and loss statement, a balance sheet, any kind of financial statement. They don't know how to do projections for their business. And these are extremely important skills if you want to grow your business. Um, if you want to go beyond one store, if you want to go beyond a lifestyle business, you have to understand how these factors affect your businesses. And there's a ton of really great tools that, that exist to learn this. Um, I just recently graduated from a program called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. If it's in your area, they're, they're in like 40 major markets, I believe. Find it, apply to it, and go to it. Um, if you don't have something like that, go to a local community college, take a class on like intro to accounting or intro to, to bookkeeping, just so you have some concept of how the numbers work and how they relate to each other. Um, are, you know, if you, if you change small things, small financial metrics in your business, it can affect your bottom line tremendously, um, whether it be how much you pay your techs, um, how many, so like I was just talking to somebody, so I, I run all my techs Monday through Saturday, nine to 5.30. They all come in at nine and they all leave at 5.30. Um, this gentleman was staggering his tech. So the first tech comes in at nine, the next one comes at 11, then 12. And I see how that makes a lot of sense. So I think that those are the kind of small changes that I could probably make in my business um, to ensure that, that there is as much, um, to ensure that, there, that those techs are motivated to do the repairs. We, we, do have, we have a commission structure. So we give techs a percentage of the gross repairs that they do. Uh, repair Shopper automatically calculates that, so it's really convenient. Um, and it definitely affects um, the kind of revenue that, that the business generates. They actually are now motivated to give out their card when they're at a bar, or they're motivated to talk to their friends and post on social media that they work at this great repair shop and that, that, you know, they, that they should talk to them when they come in. Um, that, that's worked very well for us. We started that about six months ago, and I definitely saw an uptick in the business because of it. Um, and then scaling your business. Um, this is kind of like the part where I get excited um, because I, I'm really interested in how these businesses scale. They don't scale in a lot of ways. Um, by nature, it's a, it's a tough business to scale, but there are a couple options. Uh, your, your first option is owner-operated stores, so owning all your own stores, right? Um, and, and it starts getting complicated at, at certain scale because it depends how much you're generating on one location. Um, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's, these businesses at, as one unit don't generate enough that when you get to 10 units, you have enough revenue to hire the management and support staff to run that entire entity. That's why franchising has worked for this type of model. If you're franchising, somebody else is your management entity. They're helping you find the parts, they're helping you, and, and, and that model has worked very successfully for, for a number of people. Um, if you're interested in doing franchising, uh, if, if I have any advice about that, I, I went through the process, learned, about, learned a lot about franchising, um, have a, a, a mentor who owns a lot of Burger Kings in New York, um, and it, it is a very challenging process. Um, it's a financially challenging process. You have a minimum investment of maybe $150,000 in legal fees just to get your, your FDD together and the documentation you need, and then you're in a different business. You are in the business of selling franchises. You're no longer in the repair business. And it, changed that, it changes that paradigm dram dramatically um, when you realize you're actually not, not fixing devices anymore. And you basically stop caring about your business because you're trying to, to franchise. And then you obviously have to manage the expectations for the entire, entire franchise. So franchising, I think, is a, is a great route. Um, the space is a little crowded. Um, go to any franchising convention, you'll see what I mean. Um, and I think that understanding how the franchise works before you decide, like, to me, I said, oh, I'm definitely gonna franchise, that's the way to go, and then I learned everything about franchising and it was terrifying. It just wasn't the right route for my business. Um, M&A has been really good for us, so doing acquisitions of other businesses or figuring out a way to merge with another repair shop, I think at scale, these businesses are very interesting. You know, if, if your shop is doing 1,000 plus repairs, 2,000 plus repairs, that's a really exciting business because at, at 
500 repairs, it's kind of an exciting business. And at 200 repairs, I don't know if that's the right business. And obviously, you can hope that it's going to grow to that level. But I think that you know, acquiring another store that has market share um, is not terribly difficult. Um, I've seen all different kinds of valuations for this business. I've talked to some people about you know, what they've bought repair businesses at. I've heard uh, one-time revenue. I've heard a small multiplier of, uh, of earnings. But see, see what you can do in, 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 your, in your community. And, and I think that you can also build, um, build, so we were talking about small communities, build a small community, but if you're the owner of the community, you have a lot of leverage. You can find five or 10 repair shop owners that want to get together for dinner once a quarter and talk about their businesses. That's an incredible wealth of information. And depending on how transparent they want to be, it, it could be a very, very valuable thing. I mean, I do that with a couple uh, IT company owners and we share everything down to you know, P&L and balance sheet. I show them at payrolls. I show them everything. They're in different markets, so it doesn't really matter for me. Um, but it really gets me, it helps me understand how somebody else is managing the exact same type of business that I run. Um, that also gives you an opportunity to learn if any of those businesses are worth acquiring. And you can have that. You can engage in that conversation. You can start talking to these owners and say, wouldn't this be more interesting if we did this together? Or wouldn't, you know, aren't you ready to end, you know, you know, not do this business anymore because you're 70? Or maybe you are ready to sell your business. You're ready to move into something else. But you ha now you have a captive audience of people who might be interested in purchasing that business. Um, how much time do I have left? Sorry. Okay, cool. I'll leave some time for questions. So this is uh, required reading for my course. These are the three books that I absolutely love for business. Um, the E-Myth is the first one you read. The E-Myth will tell you why small businesses don't work. It will teach you that you have to learn how to scale your business. It will teach you how to um, create systems in your business. And it will, it will explain to you why lifestyle businesses are a bad idea. Um, traction is a really cool book about, about creating exactly that traction. Um, with, with your customers, with your vendors, um, with people around you. And, and Blue Ocean Strategy is, is Jess's business model. Uh, Blue, oceans, uh, Blue Oceans are basically um, open sections of market, uh, exciting, untapped resources um, like you know, microsodding and board, board repair for repair shops. That's a Blue Ocean. So that's a, uh, it's a really good book, uh, and definitely something that's helpful. So this is where you can find me if you have any questions, and I'll, I'll open up to questions. What would be the Goldman Sachs? 10,000 Small Business Program. Yeah, 10,000. So Goldman Sachs uh, put up $500 million to grow 10,000 small businesses. And it's a free mini MBA uh, over the course of three and a half months or so. It's basically once a week for an entire day. And the cool thing about it is, most of us, when we talk about growing our businesses or, or um, talking about how our business works, it's maybe like a couple hours. This is like you spend a whole day sitting in a room talking about marketing for eight hours. Then you spend a whole day sitting in the room talking about finance for a couple. Actually, you have like three days of finance. And you get some of these um, soft, you know, business soft skills that, that you know, with a film degree didn't give me. <laughs> Um, so it was definitely very, very helpful. And, and it's not available in all markets, obviously. If you're, if you're lucky to be in a large market, they, they, will, they will have a program like that. If you're not, there's plenty of resources for, for learning these types of things. Yeah? Uh, what, how many staff do you have running each store? What sort of roles are they? And okay. how many jobs are they doing relative to the number of staff? So I have two locations, um, and and one is a uh, one is a my, my main store, I guess you can call it. Um, that store is in a thousand square feet. We do about five hundred repairs a month, and I have four technicians that work in that store: uh, manager, assistant manager, and two technicians. Um, the reason I have four, I probably don't, wouldn't need four if I was just doing um, in-store repairs, but we do a lot of on-site support out of that store. So I have a, a, I have a technician gone probably five out of eight hours of every day doing on-site support. On-site support is really an exciting thing for me um, because it's, you know, we charge 100, 150 bucks an hour depending on the particular client. The tech is making 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour. So it's, a, it's an exciting business. Um, and the other store is in Key Biscayne, which is an island. And so I wanted to test sort of what I thought was, what was my theory that in smaller markets, these stores do really well because there's no other option. Um, and, it, and it kind, it's kind of true. So my store there is 600 square feet, 
and I have uh, one technician there at a time alternating. Um, so sometimes I'll have, I'll have two that overlap sometimes, but generally there's one person in the store. That store is about a third of the revenue of the other store and about a third as many repairs, but it's the only option, like only real option on Key Biscayne for these types of services. Um, and that store is now starting to get requests for on-site services at 150 bucks an hour, which is a pretty high rate um, considering. Um, and so we're gonna have a, a second full-time technician there. Cool.